All right, so we're rolling again. That's still Monday, June the 11th, 2018, with my friend here, Ray Burkhart. And the first video with Ray uh, dealt with his multifaceted career. And we'll probably, hopefully, get back in time for that, talk about your compositional techniques and et cetera. But for the second part, uh, let's talk about your playing. And uh, because you are... Uh, asked to do so many different things. Uh, you have to play lead trumpet sometime, or you play, like I just heard uh, on uh, YouTube, you played uh, a performance uh, with a vocalist at choir. You did the trumpet shell sound. You let let the bright seraphim, uh, missing about five others. What are they? Yeah, well, um, I uh, I forget. It was, it was basically an all handle recital. All handle recital. Yeah, it was three big ar arias and three big... Uh, right. Choruses, but it was like eternal it, source of light divine. Right. The piece that was played uh, right. by David Blackadder at the royal wedding on natural trumpet. Oh, okay. yeah, big famous. And piece. Ray also plays natural trumpet, by the way. Used to, yeah. Used to, <laughs> <laughs> but I bet if the call goes out, you still have one that you can. Pick I have up. six. Yeah, I'll yeah. find. I'll find one <laughs> that'll work. Yeah. So, uh, as far as the plane goes, you anyway. You're asked to do a lot of different things at a very high level. So, first of all, how do you go from from doing lead trumpet? To playing solo trumpet or uh, ensemble work, it, do you do you change mouthpieces? Do you change trumpets? Uh, what is it you do differently? Um, well, I don't change. Well, I I, I I don't change B flat trumpets. I've mm -hmm. got the one I play when I play B flat. Which is what? Uh, it's sort of a Bach lightweight forty three. Mm -hmm. um, New York or Mount Vernon or Elkhart or Elkhart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, new in the last 15 years. 200,000 series. Okay, very so low, 200. Ones, yeah, yeah um, like 70s mine is, maybe. Mine is pretty old too. Mine's 400,000 series. So mine's, yeah. mine's new. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I found, I mean, I've, I've, I've tried lots of equipment. You know, I, uh, I've gone through all kinds of stuff like a lot of trumpet players have until I found a horn that did all that I wanted it to do. Right. And... Um, uh, Mouthpiece wise, they did the same thing. I played this same setup. Um, uh, it's a Yamaha 14B4 with a slightly opened uh, back bore. So it's a, like a 14A4, but it's got a deeper, deeper cut. Yeah, it's really like a 3C. It's like a 3C with a softer rim. The, I find the 3C, which I always carry one with me, right. kind of is sharp on my lips. Cuts right. me a little bit. Right. But it's it, it's yeah. So, so it's a 14B B4. B4. Okay. Yeah. I also take with me uh, a 14A4A when right. I want to go for the right. the real lead sound right. and uh, work a little less hard, you know, than right. on a little bigger mouthpiece. So would you warm up differently if you have a classical gig as opposed to a jazz gig as opposed to a, a lead trumpet gig? Not or? really, no. Mm -hmm. No. I just kind of uh, uh, get on the horn a little bit. I actually don't warm up uh, for very long, usually. Right. <clears throat> um, I can be done in about two minutes if I want to be. Right. Now, that's a big advantage here in L.A. because you never know when you may get a call to do something. I remember getting a call at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning to play a rehearsal with the L.A. Phil at 10 o'clock or something like that. So you don't have time to think about what you're going to be right. warming up on. You just get in the car and you go. But let's play a little bit. What do you do for your warm-up? I mean, say as a stand, do you have a... I call it uh, to have a... Uh, you have a point of reference... I think I got that from uh, Roy Popper. Uh, that you know, you have a point of reference where you start every day, uh, kind of on the same thing. Or yeah, you do. I always just start on a G, mm -hmm. and I don't tongue it. I don't. Uh, so you can point away from the mic a little bit, so it doesn't. Yeah, right. You, you don't want it right there. No. <laughs> yeah, even. Is it too far? Too yeah, close? even point over in this direction. I think. I don't even tongue the note. I like just to blow into it and just mm -hmm. find out how supple the lips are, mm -hmm. and. Um, Right from that, you can tell if they feel pretty stiff. You do that. You do more of that. Right. That's that's a very. I I, I started kind of doing the same thing, <clears throat> uh, and that's, of course, that's Caruso. You know, he he's one that said, well, the magic six notes, if you want to call it that, you start with a breath attack. But there are a lot of people that uh, do the breath attack thing. Yeah. What's the advantage of a breath attack over a tongue attack? For me, um, the tongue is a is a heavy hammer, and we nearly always play with it but if you just want to which is to say if you start by tonguing a note and you're out of shape or out of position or kind of whacked out for any reason mm -hmm. the tongue will take over and f 
and, and cover that up makes the lips respond whether they really want to or not. Right. Well, I would tongue if I was on stage. But if I want to kind of start with, how do I feel right now? Right. How much more warm-up do I need? Right. That sort of thing. Be really gentle. I start with just blowing. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement on yeah, that. Yeah, if they're sort of centered already right. and playing a lot and everything's really rocking, they'll just respond right away. And I think even Malcolm said he called uh, Jimmy Stamp one time at a session. And you, Malcolm wasn't feeling comfortable, which means he was still su superhuman, but yeah. to the rest of us, you know. But uh, so apparently Jimmy said, well, just just do a poo attack or something yeah. like that. And yeah. Kind of, uh, well, that's 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 large part who I got it from. Right. I mean, never met Stamp, but from Malcolm. Right. Yeah. So. Right. So. Um, so go ahead. Then I like yeah. to just start to slur, just start to slur with the easiest ones available. Mm hmm. Right, so you're, it reminds me also of Gatala used to say, I took lessons from Gatala, he says, you really build the house every day starting with the foundation. Right. You, know, you don't start with a roof, you start with this <coughs> process yeah. just to see where your chops are. Yeah. And um, the other thing is um, when you go f from the slurs, you see you start off with a long tone, second line G, but it also reminds me, uh, do you have any particular exercises that you like to do, like there a is. stamp or anything? Well, like, well, or all of that I like, it, right. but there's one I kind of developed, I mean, it's, it's like a hundred others probably, <clears throat> but I found as I was teaching maybe 10 years ago at Pomona College, every time I get a, st I, I would always tend to go to this and I thought, wait a minute, that's a good exercise, <laughs> write mm. that down. Right. So now I kind of go to this pretty quickly in the day. Mm -hmm. I hope it works, it comes out here. <laughs> And as I'm warming up, that's far enough to go. I mean, that's really mm -hmm. easy to do. But quickly, I want to get to the C and beyond. Mm -hmm. Right. That puts a little tension in the lip. Right. Starts right. to remind yourself how to be strong. Right. And the other thing, I don't know if you noticed about Ray's chops, but his chops... They really are nice. I wish I could borrow your chops periodically because you, I don't know if you can see it, but his chops, the lower lip, and you know, it just stays there. It, like what I do when I play higher is I start to roll my lower lip in, which I think really doesn't help. Uh, although there, Walt Johnson says he rolls his lower lip in, but that's once he gets above a high C. But for the most part, I think rolling the lower lip in as you go higher isn't going to help you. Now, is that something that came pretty natural? Uh, it's hard to say. I uh, I pretty early on, over one summer, went from you know like eighth grade wondering mm -hmm. how to finger an A above the staff right. to discovering I could play high G's above that. Right. And because of that, late seventies, uh, we were the jazz band in high school was buying and and we performing you know all those Maynard Ferguson charts. Mm -hmm. So I played all that stuff, but I didn't have any supervision. So I ended up getting some pretty bad habits. So when I came to you, as when I'm a freshman at Occidental, went right. to study with you for four years, um, I would sometimes, I mean, it's my recollection of it, I would sometimes have this very reliable range, and then mm -hmm. the next day, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I'd do all the same thing, I thought, right. and I'd go up to an IF or a G or whatever it might right. be, and it would just kind of faz out. Right. <clears throat> so my, my, my life for six years with you and then with... Uh, Rob McGregor after that right. was largely figuring out mm -hmm. how to be consistent. Right. It wasn't that the, the ability or the talent wasn't there, but but you can't really say the ability is there if the next day you can't do it, right? Right. So um, I realized it was a matter of consistency. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, one day I was in Rob's house having a lesson, and we were talking about range, and he and I played something up to high F or whatever, and he he said, um, "I see see that." What you just did right there? And I said, well, yeah, well, 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 yeah. He says, I don't want to hear that sound in my house again. <laughs> I think, I never forgot it. It's his literal words. I don't want to hear that sound in my house again. Okay, that sounded like it is. Yeah. Right, but then he showed me yeah. how there was a place where I was making a little change. I had a little crutch I was using. Mm -hmm. And and this is this is the gold of this little right. interview, if there's anything in it. 
of value. And that would be that most players have something like that. Right. Most players do a little something, mm -hmm. and they're usually unaware of it, that they subtly think it's going to make this work. Where they've found does make it work. But in mm -hmm. fact, that's the weakness. Mm -hmm. So Rob's next point was, you've got to take your good playing up. Don't make a shift. Now, that it's not like you can't shift. Some players make that work. Right. But if you were doing that and it was working, you wouldn't be going to someone for a lesson because you had a problem. So so that was some wonderful insight. Right? It was great. And I worked through Clark 2 mainly, mm -hmm. taking it up. And he, I was allowed to go no further than I could play it with my good embouchure. I see. Good. And then you work at that for a long time. I mean, many, many repetitions and for however many days or weeks it might take. And then you add a half step, which doesn't have to be weeks later. But mm -hmm. you only go until you have to be self-aware Right. That, oh, I'm doing this and I can feel it and sense it. Right. And then you have to just not let that happen. But this is actually a very tried and true way of um, building a range because you build it up for what you can do well. Right. It becomes very yeah, consistent. Yeah, I have a line that says, uh, always work from a position of strength into an area of weakness, <clears> which, <throat> which I like a lot, even if I did come up with it. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's so interesting to me uh, because you were always a good player, as you point out. And well, I didn't mean to point it out. I mean, well, I'll, I point. <laughs> uh, no, I pointed it out. I meant to point it out. You have all as long as I've known you, you've been a good player. And I remember talking to you in college and, and saying, "Yeah, you had a shot at it." You know, you, you and uh, and then you came up with a way to make it more consistent. You and Rob, that is. Uh, well, but, but you applied it. That's yeah. That was when I was finally ready for that particular lesson. Right. Right. You know, there's times. That's right. You have to be ready for a lesson. That's an important point. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that happened to me much later in my playing that I started doing stamp, and I started doing stamp uh, the way I used to do it. Uh, I haven't played yet today either, but who cares? I'm retired. And then when I go to the pedal tone, I go. I bend the trumpet up like this and push it into my upper lip, but I'd get a great sound. But I wouldn't be able to, if I tried to go higher on that armature, I couldn't do it because right. I'm buried into my upper lip. So right. I finally figured it out. <laughs> Did you hear it? <laughs> so I figured out, again, keeping the embouchure safe, secure in, in, the, in the low register and not making a change as you go to the upper register. I do think a lot of trumpet players, when they finally get some success, they think, well, that must be it. Right. As opposed to finding out that there maybe is a better solution that's a much longer range solution, but takes more work. All right, so we're going to finish part two. Part three, we'll go into playing and talk about everything. Everybody wants to know about these three things. Endurance, upper register, two things. Endurance and upper register. <laughs> Beautiful.